communities start to remove ourselves by effectively either, um, well, basically calling on, on the uh, resources to be reciprocated or, or um, charge them penalties for not releasing those assets back to the administration of the community. So we can hit them in a hip pocket way, in a structural way. But I believe that if we keep approaching it as islands, as one by one, I don't believe we're going to get any reaction from them because quite frankly, I don't think they're awake at the moment. I don't think they even care at the moment. Yeah? Right. Oh, and the system's designed to knock people off one at a time. It's not sure. set up to, for a mass, um, for lack of a better word, revolt. But, um, That's right. So, so if it's okay, I mean, what I would like to explore, and, and hope we have the time to do this properly, and well, we do have the time to do it properly by being proactive, not reactive, is let's finish the framework that we're doing with the workbenches and the communities, and let's approach this remedy of removal of the presumptions as a community now, not as individual islands, because I don't see any remedy, nor do I see any respect by them to the right of a man or a woman, but I know at a society level they have never faced a more comprehensive uh, adversary than uh, the Eucadia community model. Sure, and, and just a quick observation based on uh, <clears throat> more or less my own experience, anecdotal as it may be. <clears throat> as I live in western New York and in this area, it's, we're, it's pretty free. People, most people will actually stand under oath here. And as you were yeah. discussing before, if you ask them to uh, show the warrant, I'm telling you, these folks will show you a warrant, <laughs> okay? So I just yeah. had the uh, experience where I would send a tax bill, and I said, show me the warrant. And they did. And one district, their their warrant was actually properly filled out. And yeah. my hometown, they mess theirs up, so I just let them know, hey, you know, you filled this out wrong. If you're going to issue, you know, this district's going to issue a warrant, at least fill it out properly, okay? So um, even competent people, like I see in this area, they're just doing what they've always done. And they're, even whether it's wrong whether it's wrong or not, and they don't even understand it, but they just know we've been doing this. Now, I'll just contrast that to experience I recently had at another home in South Carolina. Yeah. Right? My wife was summoned to appear as a juror, right? So I, right. I called up the clerk and I said, under what authority? You know, under what law? Under what authority? And by the way, this summons isn't even properly filled out. It wasn't signed. It was just a stamped out form. They print off a copy machine or whatever, right? Yeah. And, well... Within about 15, I made a couple calls and kind of called them, asked them to stand under oath, etc. They got really angry. They hung up on me. And about 10 minutes later, I got a phone call from Lieutenant Johnny of the of the uh, SLED, which is a Southern, what is that, the South Carolina Law Enforcement, okay? He's like sort of a yeah. state trooper. He's calling me up saying, I'm going to come, basically come out and arrest you for harassing the clerk. I just simply yeah. ask very polite questions. So locality, where you live, and how the system is going to react to you is entirely different. Let me tell you, in South Carolina, you stand up to many of the – in many of the counties down there, it doesn't matter how right you are or the, the rightness of your cause. They're going to slam you in chains and throw you in jail, <laughs> okay? And that's that. Again, here where I live, I could actually go to my county executive and say, show me your oath, because I've, I've tested this. That, that show me your oath. And you know what they did? At first they resisted when I called the clerk. They were like, oh, we don't, you know, basically have to show you anything. I'll go, oh, yeah? I go, well, the county executive is under oath, and I want to see it. Two days later, they email my copy of his oath. So, again, just uh, to get off the line real quick and sum it up. Locality. It's, uh, it's, it's good, good, good advice. Um, yeah, locality, locality, locality. It's like a real estate, location, location, location. <laughs> no, many thanks, Dean. Thanks very much. No, thank you so much, Frank. And, um, again, uh, 
I'm here at any time uh, to help the society advance our uh, uh, advance the cause. And thank you, everybody out there, uh, for all the good work that everyone's doing, like Ron and uh, everyone else. Thank you so much, everyone. Good on you, Dave. See you later. Bye bye. Yeah, that's a very good point there from Dane. Uh, look, let's let's get back to uh, to see if we have another question here. So, um, we'll go we'll go actually to Ron. I was just reading through some of the questions, but Ron, can you hear us? Hello, Ron. Hi, Frank. Yeah. Are we on? You hear on? Yeah, I'm here. Um, <clears throat> well, I been doing a lot of research on on the federal authority um, what I've discovered is that and um, I'm going to give a history lesson so people can understand what's going on in the states in 1871 the District of Columbia was created in its own government called the United States and then from 1873 to 1875 Congress devoted two full years of creating statutes and code for the United States, all capital. Not the United States of America, by the way. The statute books on both sides of 1873 to 1875 say uh, public laws in relation to the United States of America. So, in 1933 was the final death nail of America where they totally abandoned the Constitutional Republic, and went into strictly code, code enforcement. Now, all of these folks that have taken an oath, they've taken an oath to a corporation constitution. In fact, they took the Constitution, the original organic Constitution, and uh, adopted it and changed a few words to be the bylaws for their new corporation that is domiciled in Washington, D.C., So, all of these people that work for the federal government on down through the states because they've been all gobbled up, they actually work for corporations. Now, my point is, if all of these, these judges and these prosecutors and whoever are working for the corporation, in which they are, even the president works for a corporation. Yep. How can the president delegate authority down to a judge unless it's just between corporate members, right? Well, that's the, that's now you've hit the nail on the head. Remember, we went back to the, the presumption that we're less than a slave. We're good. Right. Yeah. Yep. Of the, of the corporation. The corporation's authority <clears throat> is the emperor's new clothes. That is, when you expose the presumption, there's nothing behind it. Right. You cannot, the corporation has no authority to issue a warrant because it has no ability to claim those things as the monarch. We're not a subject of the corporation. The corporation either owns us as res, as property, uh, or, or it holds uh, an agent relationship which we can negate. It means that the corporation really has no real authority other than presumption, and once the presumption is removed, all the corporation can do is use militia force to enforce its codes, yep. which is what it's doing. But, Frank, getting back to asking a judge for his warrant of authority, yeah, he, he could say, well, it came from the Supreme Court, just the Supreme Court, or it came from the President of the United States. I've never seen one. And well, I've never I, seen I, one I would, being but I would answer wrong. So, Sorry to interrupt. I'd say... I, I didn't ask where it came from. I asked to see it. Right. If, but. if, you're, if, you're, if you're sitting there, and, and I've just established that you are not my agent. I have not appointed you. You have not been acknowledged, and I do not recognize you as, as an agent. So right. you're not there as an arbitrator. That means you, are, you have some reserve power you're claiming, and that must be under warrant. Otherwise, you have no authority, and you are a usurper. Um, show me your warrants. Show me where it comes from. Show it sealed and signed. And if you don't, then dismiss this case with prejudice right now. Well, my point is, what if he did produce a warrant and it was signed by the president? The president... Well, it has no effect because it's a corporation. Exactly. Right. The president is still in charge of the corporation. 
Exactly. Then you'd say it's it's a it's a false warrant because the, he is merely the CEO of a corporation, and by what authority does he claim over me? Right. And there's I another. Can't... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's another another wrinkle in this whole thing. The Congress. We think we you know we vote for Congress members, right? And they represent. They're supposed to represent the people. Right. Well, if you think about this, those guys are really just board members of the corporation. Sure, that's right. You know? So all they're Perfect. doing is making yeah. rules and regulations for McDonald's and Walmart. Correct. But look, it, it, the, the thing is, and you would you would agree to this, fear and awe are very powerful things, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Fear and awe. Shock and awe, I think. Shock and awe. Shock and awe. Yep. Yeah, yep. It, it, and and uh, from from time immemorial, it's uh, it's worked a, a treat most of the time. But you saw in the Soviet Union that people after a while become immune, and that's what I think is happening now. Don't you? Yes, I do. Thanks, Ron, for that. Going, yeah. eh, who cares? <laughs> so what? <laughs> thanks. Thanks again, Ron. Good on you for that. All right. Bye. Bye. Uh, before we get to the next call, thanks again, Ron, and I really appreciate everything that, that uh, Ron is sharing and all of you are sharing. Uh, before we get to the next call, up, I just want to answer a question here in the chat by guest 12. It says, uh, what is my position on driving without insurance and injuring another human? What I would say first off, and I've said this over and over and over again, if you choose, for whatever reason, if you choose to drive without a license they issue, and if you choose to drive without insurance that they issue, then you make yourself a target. And whilst you may feel that you have a right or believe you have a right to travel, and there is a history to show that they privatise the roads and they enclose those rights, by making yourself a target, you really make the argument much, much easier for them and allow them to not debate you on the fundamental question of whether you are or you aren't a slave, whether they are allowed to monetize your life and reap the benefits of it. So because there are bigger issues, there are more important issues, because driving without a license, driving without insurance, driving without plates puts you smack bang in front of their trained militia, and that's all they are, corporate militia, policy officers, called police officers, spelled pol police, but policy. It is utter madness. I mean, it's sheer stupidity. It's like into the valley, the brave 300 or 600 uh, marched uh, of, the, uh, of the British army. Why do that? Why march to your death? It achieves nothing. You're throwing away your life. Instead, get a license, get the insurance and choose where and when to contest, to object uh, and to ultimately succeed against this system. So if you were to drive without a driver's license, without insurance and injure another person, then you put yourself, as, as anyone that creates an, an injury, you put yourself in a position then you need to make good. So I guess to have a hope I answered your question and my, my uh, uh, comments on that. I hope I answered that question for you. Let me get to the next caller, Harriet, and then I'll keep going. If you want to speak live, please press star eight and uh, call us. Harriet, can you hear us? Hello. Hi, Harriet, how are you? Um, Hello, Harriet. My name's not Harriet. Am, am I on? Yes, can you hear me? I've got. Sorry, your your uh, your. I'm sorry for that, but your call said Harriet. But um, yes, you're on. You're on air. Okay. Um, my question is: Where is the proper place to file an affidavit? And the second part of my question is: Is ten days long enough to allow for anyone to rebut it? Okay. The first. The first part of your question is where is the proper place to file an affidavit? Yes. The concern 
about filing an affidavit is that the word affidavit itself 